<laughs> okay. Hello, welcome. My name is Steve Hewitt. I'm in the Department of History at the University of Birmingham. I run a couple of things called Terrorizing History. One is YouTube channel where you might be watching this right now. And the other is a Twitter feed called Terrorizing History where I tweet regularly about uh, historical events related to terrorism, counterterrorism, uh, and, and violence uh, more generally. I'm very pleased today to have, I think this is now the fourth one of these interviews I've done with different people about their scholarship. Very pleased today to have Dr. Henry Price, who last year got his PhD from the University of Birmingham. He's an amazing scholar. He's accomplished a lot. He's done it all despite having the great misfortune of having been taught by me as an undergrad, <laughs> grad, he's managed to overcome that and, and achieve a lot uh, in early in his career. And the reason he's here today is because he is an expert on incels. And so today we're gonna to talk about his research, uh, a little bit about the history of incels and a little about where we are today with incels and, and maybe a little bit about where we're gonna go in the future. And as ever, we are at the whim of technology, so hopefully nothing will freeze or cut out or anything like that, um, but we'll just push on either way. Welcome, Henry. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for uh, having me here, Steve, and uh, really, really excited to be able to talk about something that doesn't get discussed all that much, really. <laughs> so, so tell us about your research. Yeah, okay. So my, um, I mean, my background, I did, I was on the um, American and Canadian studies course back when I was an undergraduate where uh, I took some foreign policy classes with, with Steve. Um, I then moved into kind of looking at political economy um, and then came kind of back into looking at subcultures um, uh, for my PhD thesis. Um, and what, what, what really drove that move was when I was looking at political economy, uh, or when I was working in that kind of field, I, I'd been really interested in the adoption of a kind of select feminist politics into governing structures of power. Um, so looking at how kind of certain feminist ideas might be adopted by various governments of different political persuasions and developed a kind of new normal where um, feminism was taken into account. Um, and also in popular culture, okay, so you had a rise of kind of visible feminist campaigning, celebrities were, were very vocal about being a feminist. So we, we're talking about, you know, probably from 2006 up until uh, 2015, say. And what I noticed was that, that a lot of critiques were being made about uh, how kind of feminist radicalism was being defanged or mainstreamed by its entanglement with um, governments, with, with, with legal structures, with popular culture. Um, and of course, feminism has a you know, tradition of being quite radical and oppositional to uh, governing structures and to the state specifically. And so all this work was going on about critiquing popular feminism or post-feminism. Um, and I, what I wanted to do was um, I wanted to ask the same question of what was increasingly unescapable, which was a backlash to feminist visibility, a backlash that was particularly prominent in online spaces. So while you had the rise of kind of visible feminist campaigning, um, and I'd include me too in, in, in that, um, you know, you know, the variety of things really. Um, what, 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 I, what I thought we could do is say, well, how about this kind of anti-feminist backlash? Is, is that in different ways entangled with uh, what I would call a neoliberal kind of um, governance structure in the broadest sense? And that's what really drove me to, to, to wanting to investigate anti-feminist subculture at the time. Um, 2014, um, there was the Elliot Roger murders, who um, was, uh, uh, Elliot Roger was uh, a young man who went on a, a killing spree in California um, and left this, this really quite, quite amazing kind of portfolio of YouTube videos, a manifesto that was hundreds of pages long, where he detailed 
his struggles um, with forming sexual relationships. And that, that, that event, the, 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 the murders really brought Incel um, into the kind of more of a popular a, a consciousness, I suppose. And um, what, what really drove me to Incel compared to perhaps some other anti-feminist kind of groups was that Incel was distinct in being resolutely pessimistic about um, changing things essentially and it was it, it stood out for me because it wasn't one of those kind of um anti-feminist movements where there is a clear attempt to change society it was um instead uh very proud of the fact or, or very vocal about the fact proud probably not the right word um that they that they represented the dregs of society and the losers of the sexual revolution. So I thought this was all very interesting stuff. And so that was kind of the focus of my my PhD research. And subsequent to that, um, unfortunately, I've had to work uh, in 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 different areas. So I'm working in the business school at the moment and, and, and enjoying it thoroughly. But but um, my engagement with incel and anti-feminist work is now, I suppose, focused in a little bit on trying to unpick the dominant ways of um, the dominant ways in which incel is portrayed in the media and in this emerging academic literature, which is still quite small. Um, it's growing um, and growing in specific disciplines as well, and 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 terrorism studies would would be one of them. Um, but yeah, so so that's where I'm at now. I'm like I'm unpicking kind of um, the different ways that I see what I was studying kind of six years ago, being presented now in 2022. And, and obviously, what you've also described is the sort of precarity that lots of young academics find themselves in at the moment, which is one of the reasons why many of us have been on strike over the last um, few months. Could you explain a little of the socio-historical rise of incels? Because I think that is also something that's sort of left out of the current narrative, that there's a, a longer sort of historical context to, to this. Absolutely, yeah. So, so, so I mentioned in 2014, you have, you have the Elliot Roger case. But, but prior to that, I mean, one thing I should say is that, that there are histories of incel available online often from anonymous sources and pieced together sometimes from lots of anonymous sources. They're all disputed. The, the, the socio-historical history of incel is, is highly disputed. However, you know, there certainly is one there. And um, what I can say that's kind of least controversial, contestable is that um, certainly, you know, involuntary uh, celibates and celibates have existed throughout history, and we can see this in, in literary sources mostly. Um, but in terms of, uh, of an incel that, that is recognisable to the one that we, we see today, you have to look at very early internet culture, very early internet culture. So you've got 1989, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, or maybe even 88, I think, you've got the alt support um, shyness uh, group, Usenet group, which is still accessible actually via Google groups and, or it was last year. And it's a fascinating thing to go and read actually, because, uh, you know, it, it's this kind of rudimentary message board type platform where you have um, uh, uh, people discussing shyness is the word that they were using more at this stage. Um, you also, you know, this, this is minor in terms of numbers of users, but it is clearly a kind of a precedent of what we see today in terms of where incels congregate. It's nearly exclusively on anonymous message boarding sites. Not entirely, it's, it's migrated, particularly in the last five years, but certainly for the, 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 the majority of the, the, um, the timeline, it's in these kinds of spaces. Um, so you have this, these Usenet groups, you also have something called um, Alana's Involuntary Celibacy Project, which is the first time, or at least one of the first times, this is contested for predictable reasons really, um, the involuntary celibacy, the term is used. This is in 1998, so a full 10 years after the, the original Usenet group. 
And um, what's really noticeable about these online, these original groups is that they welcomed women um, to be members and to, to post messages. Um, in, in the Alana case, the website was administered by a, a queer woman from Toronto, which is not the kind of figure that you typically associate with incels today. And uh, so, so this, this, this is kind of the, 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 the origins, as it were. Now, if you look through the message boards, if you look through these sites, which I did during my thesis, you notice that even then there was certainly a, a kind of a developing schism or fissure within the community of people posting there about whether or not women um, suffered from or, or suffered the consequences of shyness or involuntary celibacy in the same way that men did and whether or not men and women could communicate on reasonably equal footings about these issues. So there, there's a split and this split is kind of more formalized in, in the two major um, incel forums that, that, that start to pop up in the early noughties to mid noughties. You have a group called Incel Support, which ultimately collapses in 2013, which is more welcoming of women hate speech is, is, is moderated and people are banned from these groups. And then Love Shy, uh, which existed up until very recently, um, which emphasized free speech much more and eventually became a place that was home to the kind of misogyny that, that is more typical of, of incel forums today. 2004, you see the Wikipedia entry for incel. Uh, you also see in 2004 4chan as a, as a major platform for kind of incel ideas to emerge um and this kind of this this kind of develops through the, the early noughties really um in in towards 2010 you have three more key sites that i think are worth mentioning now um pick uh, pick up artist hate p p u a hate uh, slut hate and lookism so these are three websites that become really key for not just incels, but the kind of collision of different ideas and perspectives on male suffering in the age of sexual autonomy, uh, which would be a, a, a way that they'd have, you know, the, the, the founders of those sites probably would have described it, I imagine. They didn't explicitly identify as incel, but a lot of these ideas start to germinate here and, and I, I, I did identify three key things from these sites, which, which become kind of central to incel, which is attractiveness, physical attractiveness can be numerically measured, it can be quantified. Um, society collectively discriminates against unattractive men. Um, unattractive men are, are the, the, the lowest of the low in modern society. And that uh, the, the mainstreaming of feminist ideas in popular culture, in law and in politics are to various extents to blame for this situation. And these, these, are, these are core ideas. And then 2014, Elliot Roger, who posted on Pickup Artist Hate, commits his murders. His online portfolio is dissected. Um, uh, Pickup Artist Hate and Slut Hate are both uh, closed, they're banned straight away. And then you have, uh, up until very recently, the two major incel forums, which are, uh, a subreddit, our incels, which is now um, being banned, and incels.co, uh, but it changes um, server because it keeps on getting banned. But And, and I believe that this, this forum still exists today. So, um, you know, you've seen you've seen it, you know, it's a long kind of convoluted history that that's very much an abbreviated right, right. <laughs> take on it, but, but that's it. And, and just quickly about the black pill. This is the idea from the matrix. People take the black pill and see what effectively the hopelessness of their situation and there's nothing they can do about it. And yeah. So, it. so, so, yeah, very briefly. Yep, you're right. The, the matrix uh, idea of well, the, the you, you're offered the blue and the red uh, and the red right. pill originally, right. right? And yeah, riffing on on a Baudrillard kind of theme here about there being a, a contrapositive, the idea that there is a, a, a reality that is being um, uh, hidden from you that you can't see, and that um, obviously it, 
to be clear that the, the the blue pill red pill analogy is used so generally now that it doesn't mean right. necessarily anything to do with yeah. sexual relations sexual domain but in the case of incel and the manosphere more generally which is this a term used to describe this assemblage of different kind of subcultures of which incel is one um the blue pill is is received wisdom that if you dress nicely if you wash yourself if you're um reasonably uh, uh normal and friendly that, that anyone can can have a successful relationship um and that 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 men are typically um uh, uh failing in this venture only if there is some serious faults within how they present themselves and behave the red pill is the idea then that that this isn't true that 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 physical attraction trumps any other characteristic of the person that if uh, and and they go into great detail about this so you know the the, the how many centimeters your wrist is um uh, your hairline your jaw your your height all these things contribute um far more than your personality or anything like that um so that's the red pill and then the black pill which is where kind of incels come in is that they they agree with this kind of diagnosis of the situation offered by the red pill that that uh, unattractive men are, are are really in trouble and there's not much they can do about it um but <laughs> what differentiates the black pill is is the complete resignation to this terrible situation so with the red pill you have these kind of self-improvement type um uh, type logics that permeate a lot of the discourse in red pill groups pickup artists being the most kind of infamous ones this idea that by learning game as they call it um you can uh, you can overcome you know the fact that we have an anti-male popular culture and an anti-male government we can we can overcome this by learning uh, tricks of, of psychology and we can work out and make ourselves muscular and et cetera, et cetera. The black pill says, no, this, you cannot change uh, yourself physically drastically enough <laughs> to make up the odds against you. What it will take is either extreme body modification, plastic surgery, um, and that's the only thing, or potentially becoming a multimillionaire of course because women are, are driven solely by 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 money and by looks but looks first um and so the black pill yeah is used to kind of describe this hopelessness and it's kind of summed up in the acronym lay down and rot which is offered as the um kind of the vision the the future horizon as it were of of the individual incel all they can do is uh try to distract themselves whilst they slowly die. So you, Henry has an article coming out in an edited collection uh, about toxic masculinities. And uh, I had a chance to read the article and it was absolutely fascinating. And one of the points you make in it, Henry, is I think again, when the media uses the label and to a certain extent when academics use the label, people think that there's this coherent single vision of what an incel is and what you point out in the article is you know when we talk of community and culture there's multiple versions of this among incels and some of the ideas are contradictory and also that again it's problematic to simply see incels as white supremacists because there's considerable evidence that uh, large numbers of non-white people non-white men um, uh, make up in cells as well. So can we speak of a community? Should we talk about communities and cultures? And is it real? Is there a danger of researchers or the media in a sense creating the impression of coherence where there isn't actually coherence? It's a really great question. Um, and, and it's one that, that, that I've kind of been reflecting on a little bit myself. I think, um, so I think you're right, in essence, um, it probably does make more sense ultimately to talk about communities and cultures. Um, and I do think that there's a tendency um, to, to homogenize both in, in kind of academia, um, but, but more, more prominently in kind of um, 
journalist accounts, kind of reporting, media reporting, which is where most people find out about incel, you know, these horrible cases, the case in Plymouth, um, not so long ago, Jake Davison, really quite, quite tragic events. And it, and it, it lends itself to a homogenization. And, and so I think, I think you can, you can see this in the way incel has become a very generalized pejorative now in online spaces. Oh, you're just an incel. And it means, what does it mean really in practice? It means, well, we think that you don't know how to talk politely to women or you're a woman hater or you're ugly. Sometimes, ironically, this, this has become a, a, a kind of thing. So what I, I, I agree with you or, or what you're suggesting there. I, th I think I think what's potentially quite quite interesting is that that because there's an emerging literature on incel, I think that this is something that will change in time. I think as more work is done on incels and there's more kind of understanding about where to access kind of incel logics and arguments because nowadays really you have you have YouTube channels, you, you, you know, incel, it, the incel community and culture has migrated to so many different places. You know, there are, there are YouTube channels with, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers now that, that kind of discuss incel topics and the incel kind of way of looking at the world. Um, so, so we have to kind of respond to that in, in the way we do analysis. I think you, you, you raised there, and I, I touch on this in the article about white supremacism and and kind of the racial politics of incel. And this is a really fantastic example for highlighting the divergences that that go missing, and and really significant divergences as well. Particularly, I suppose, if you're looking from the perspective of you know terrorism studies or security studies, because you know that's a huge. That's a huge thing to miss that there's that there is a really quite febrile debate in incel spaces about the role of race in how attractive you are. So, you know, the incel worldview kind of stipulates that there's a science of attraction and that you can quantify it. And yet you have a lot of people in incel spaces who aren't white, might be living in, in kind of white majority areas of the world, potentially, but who, who say, no, look, I have an additional I have an additional burden here because, for example, um, Indian men uh, 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 are, are, are not considered um, attractive de facto in popular culture now because we have a racist popular culture, right? Now, the implication of this is that, you know, there is a social construction in, in how we come, how we set terms, standards of beauty, which contradicts massively um, all this stuff about, you know, science of attraction and that, um, you know, you can you can measure your worth through how many Tinder matches you have or how many sexual encounters you've had. So that's a really important kind of example, I think, of how future research needs to really, really properly and seriously engage in this kind of contradiction. And um, I'd certainly recommend that as an area if people are interested to go into because there's, there's, as, as far as I'm aware there's not really a paper that properly delves into that issue around white supremacism mm. and it needs to be done because it's there you know uh, that's something maybe you should do as, uh, <laughs> yeah. a, a future project so is the thing that binds it all together in a sense into a into an ideology or a coherent worldview is it really a kind of negative or an oppositional element as in anti-feminism is what connects these various disparate threads into one sort of, co or even outright misogyny is what binds all of it together. So you've got contradictions, but at its heart, it's, it's what connects all of these elements is uh, uh, hatred of feminism, uh, misogyny, um, elements of both. Um, uh, Okay, so the most vocal incel kind of micro celebrities that you'd see online would certainly say no, <laughs> that this that the incels are not misogynist. They might be anti-feminist to some degree because they see feminist overreach. And let's face it, anti-feminism is not a niche 
position right. no, these days, true. certainly not on the internet. So, so we need to be clear about that and that there's a culture war setting in which a lot of this is going on as well. Um, my take on it is, is that, that and, and I should actually, I should also say that there are still minor um, incel kind of subgroups, as it were, which um, have followed the tradition of those early incel groups that permit women speak they're they're marginal though that they're, they're, they are really marginal um i'd say that for the, the vast majority of 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 incel as as it exists today is anti-feminist and its rage manifests in misogyny and self-hatred i'd say so in in addition to um anti-feminism as being a kind of a unifying strand i'd say self-hatred to some degree is also a unifying bond which you don't see in other manosphere groups men going their own way do not consider themselves um uh, 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 as failures or unsuccessful nor do pickup artists nor do male rights activists i think that's really important the other thing and this is you know, I find sometimes find it hard to communicate this point, but I think it's really important. Incels are absolutely, uh, or incel rather, is, is absolutely focused on um, an abstract idea of the market as being the uh, provider of evidence of, of their own worldview. Now, by that, I mean that this focus on being able to quantify your value as a human being. Is, um, is, is, is integral to, to the worldview. It doesn't work if you can't measure your success, your value as a person. So this is why you see absolute, like hundreds, thousands of, of uh, threads in incel spaces and, and, and topics on YouTube videos about, A, can I, can I, can I um, demonstrate my own lack of success through, um, using uh, a tin, uh, like a, a tinder type game where you use a picture of yourself or, or someone who you deem unattractive have a very nice profile a biography description and then you have a picture of a model for example but you 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 say that you're you know racist homophobic all the rest and then you you compare the two and you see hey look it's 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 good looking people who get all the girls unattractive people nothing else matters okay but but that 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 idea that you can that you can capture all this in these these number games is is across the board it's there it's implicit in every kind of incel type argument i'd say so i I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you with the the, the anti-feminism um which manifests in misogyny but also this this attachment to, to the idea of quantifying um, quantifying your own value through a kind of abstract market right, mechanism. Right. So essentially, this is the last question, but it's it's a very big question, um, and this is something you touch upon in the article, and you've touched upon in the interview. I mean, most incels are more of a threat to themselves, and and it's quite easy in a sense to understand this sort of uh, sense of hopelessness um, undoubtedly in some cases leads to suicide as other forms of abuse of, of themselves but there are also some of them a small number it has led to attacks on others particularly women we've had attacks in the UK you mentioned that one already you mentioned Elliot Roger uh, in Canada the uh, Toronto van attack Canada became the first country in the world to charge a suspected incel with a terrorism offense. Do you believe that incels or the incel dumb or incel ideology can lead to terrorism? That you believe incels are terrorists? I know we we did a version of this a year ago, and you I think you were skeptical about this linkage between incels and terrorism, but it's become again one of these hot, trendy things in terrorism studies to the point where. Uh, one of the gurus of the field, Bruce Hoffman, is is written is writing about the topic. And I think the, it, it, there's issues around gender, particularly masculinities, that I think are really under researched. 
when it comes to terrorism studies, particularly lone actor terrorism, which is almost exclusively men carrying out these attacks. But what do you think in terms of, of this linkage and, and you know, treating it as a terrorism offense uh, when, when violence or attempted violence is done by a suspected incel? question at the moment and it, it was a year ago and it, and it remains a hot topic today and um my my skepticism remains i think um I, I and i should be clear you know i'm i'm not i'm not that familiar with with safeguarding and, and that certainly hasn't been and security studies that hasn't been the the kind of approach that i've taken but um i would say that my knowledge of kind of prevent style strategies around um fighting radicalization um to me just sat, applying that to incel just sounds like a nightmare scenario for me because i mean we've already touched on how generalized anti-feminist backlash is i mean the, these types of arguments and this is something that certainly happened since i was studying in cell 2017 some of these arguments now are you know you read them in the daily telegraph you, you know what i mean this idea that this argument's been made about the far right as well, that so many of the, and we just, the French election yesterday, yeah. where the second place is the far right candidate, where these ideas have become so mainstream that it's hard as well to, how do you have a counter radicalization on far right when uh, a serious presidential candidate is espousing some of the, the, those beliefs, but sorry, go on. No, I mean, uh, that, that, no, that's a really good example <laughs> as well. And, it, and it's not just it's not just in France, is it? I mean, you, you kind of look, can look a variety of places in, in Western Europe, across the world, really, at, at how um, how these ideas um, have, have, have really migrated to, to kind of kind of mainstream parts of the media landscape. Um, so uh, I, I think one of the other dangers about approaching this as a kind of a, a case of terrorism is that it does somewhat feed into the incel self identification as you know transgressive truth tellers mm. brave brave um people who are who are willing to to acknowledge the downtrodden and give a voice to the voiceless i mean incel is in some sense i identifies itself as a freedom fighting type um I, I, I'm, I'm always reluctant to use the word movement, but there's certainly an app that there are aspects of incel that, that do um, seek to make social upheaval and to open the eyes of all the, you know, blue pilled normie masses to the, the real suffering that's going on, um, which is, you know, in and of itself, really interesting, actually, incel as, as, as kind of freedom fighters, but, but to go back to your question, policing them as, as a terrorist threat just just fuels that that sense of grievance and that no one's willing to to acknowledge what what they do what, how they suffer one thing i'd add to, to kind of finish my answer to that question though was um and you, you touched on that that you know one of the biggest threats um posed is, is to the the self to the individual in, in the inside worldview and this is where I think something could be done, which is when I was doing my data collection, I was spending, you know, several hours a day for two weeks at a time on incel spaces. And I saw, you know, hundreds of messages being posted by the same account, um, you know, in a very short space of time. And I can say from reading those messages and my own reflections on how constantly reading these these threads and watching these videos made me feel it's not it's not a good it's not a good environment for anybody i mean really it, it's a place where people's kind of most intimate insecurities these are usually i'd say probably hormonal you know late teens early 20s men are being confirmed over and over again in it, it, it people these people probably do need help yeah you know how you, how you do that and whether or not you involve incel or, or terrorism in that, I'm not so sure. I don't know, but but it's again. I think there are parallels with uh, lone actor terrorists, where mm. it, it, again, this is a controversial issue about linkages with mental health issues, but um, many of them are in need of help um, from from probably non-security, non-police agencies. <laughs> 
that sorry that just brought another question which i i've thought of what it, do you have any idea about average ages of incels? Like, do you have incels who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or do they tend to be young men in their 20s? Um... Uh, so, so a lot of the, the, you know, the vast majority of data is self-reported. So whether or not right, you can sure. believe it or not is, is another matter. Um, back in when I was doing my original data collection in 2017, um, one of the key sites, incels.co, regularly ran polls to try and get a demographic impression of its user base. The majority of people were between the ages of 18 and 24. Right. There certainly are um, uh, uh, incels, older, increasingly incels who, who now suffer, <laughs> whose suffering as it were is I think being enhanced by the sense that they're miss, you know, there's always a sense in the incel spaces of that I'm missing out on on my sexual awakening I'm missing out on being recognized as a proper member of society who can form a sexual relationship as these people move into their early 30s I think a lot a, a lot of a lot of people just move on mm -hmm. from the incel stuff they might hold those views to some degree going forward and actually one of the interesting things about the major incel forum is that if you're sexually active you are permitted still to post you're just not allowed to talk about it. Whereas right. women, are, women are not allowed to post period, regardless yeah. of whether or not they're sexually active. So, so, so the, the question then becomes what, what happens to the incel after the hormones kind of lessened a bit, they're in there, they're moving into, into a time where probably people they know are getting married and having children, etc. They do exist. And, and if anything, to be honest with you, in those, those subreddits that I do still follow, um, uh, for instance, and the ones over 30, they're, they're, they're less angry and sadder. I mean, and that's just, I mean, that's just anecdotal really about yeah, what I've read. Yeah. It's certain. Great. I mean, thank you so much for this. This is absolutely fascinating research and obviously uh, lots of more opportunities for you in terms of, of where you go with this work. And, and we look forward, I'm sure, the people listening to this as well to reading your published work and, and um, learning more about this because obviously it, it is sadly a topic that um, one suspects given the pandemic with uh, lots of people feeling alienated uh, spending too much time online uh, this is one of these topics that is not going to disappear uh, anytime soon the um it's funny that you mentioned that about pandemics you know because when the lockdown started one of the, the most common uh, uh, reflections on incel forums was finally the rest of the world knows what it's like to live like we do every day for our lives. Uh, so yeah, really spot on. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Henry, and uh, good luck and, and take care. And thank you for everyone watching and um, um, look forward to doing more interviews with others in the future. Thanks, Henry.